Hi everyone, uh, I'm Charit, and today I'm going to show you how to build state-of-the-art compiler optimizations with minimal human burden. Compilers translate high-level language programs into low-level languages, which can be directly executed on hardware. And one of the main goals of an optimizing compiler is to find one such semantic preserving translation that will also generate fast code. And generally, this is done using a number of different stages. First, the compiler translates the high-level language into an intermediate representation, which is next fed through a number of different transformation passes with the objective of producing an optimized version of it. Finally, this optimized intermediate representation is lowered down into machine code, which your hardware knows how to execute. And as of late, designing, developing, and maintaining these transformation passes, which are responsible for the compiler optimizations, has become complex. Compilers now need to reason about how better to optimize millions of programs with different computational patterns, targeting a plethora of different hardware platforms with different architectural capabilities. In spite of these complexities, however, compile optimizations are still constructed using technology that existed decades ago. Compile optimizations use handcrafted heuristics and usually only follow one hard-coded optimization strategy and are not that responsive to changes in the computing environment. And this design has a number of different disadvantages. Firstly, hard-coded compiler optimizations can be fragile and fixing them up can be even more tedious. To illustrate this point, let's look at compile auto vectorization, an important compiler optimization pass that you can find in virtually every uh, compiler, production level compiler that's out there. I did a small experiment. I compiled two different benchmarking applications and observed what the compiler would do in each case. For the first solver application, BT, the compiler was not successful at vectorizing an important piece of code, whereas for the second simulation application, NAMD, the compiler was indeed successful at vectorizing. The compiler I'm using here is LLVM, by the way. Next, I did a, a, a small experiment where I manually change the decisions made by the compiler and re-benchmarks both of these bench, uh, benchmarking codes. What I found out was that in each case, there was appreciable performance gains. For the first solver application, the encapsulating function got sped up by more than 3.7x just by vectorizing that important piece of code, resulting in, in an end-to-end -end speed up of more than 20%. Similarly, for the simulation application, just by not vectorizing that piece of code, the encapsulating function got sped up by more than 1.7x, resulting in an end-to-end -end speed up of more than 10%. So next, I wanted to see why exactly the compiler made these erroneous judgments. In the first case, the compiler does not even consider that opportunity for vectorization due to a bad a heuristic. And in the second case, the compiler makes an erroneous judgment due to a bad profitability metric. So since we have now identified these problems, the next task is to actually correct it. So in the current way of uh, uh, constructing compile optimizations, you would have to deploy manually written two, uh, two manually written patches to correct this situation. And mind you, these are only two problems that I found. There are maybe thousands of other code patterns which are not properly handled by compilers. And if you want to deploy uh, manually written patches, it would uh, be uh, more or less tedious. And as I've already shown uh, for the solver example case, compile optimizations can become easily stale, especially if they are manually written. And most of the compile optimizations rely on profitability metrics or cost models. And as I already shown in the simulation application case, these cost models can be erroneous. In fact, LLVM's Intel performance model is actually maintained by Sony with mainly access to AMD hardware. And our experiments show that this has an error rate of almost 20%. So compiler developers do not trust these performance models. So in fact, most of the important compiler transformations are turned off by default without a good profitability metric. So with all of these problems, I suggest that we need a better way to construct compile optimization. Okay, 
to see how we can achieve this, let's look at what has changed around compilers. Nowadays, developers develop millions of programs daily, and they have access to better optimization algorithms, be it discrete or continuous software. And most importantly, they have access to complex and, hardware, uh, complex and powerful hardware platforms. So my solution is to leverage these changes in the computing environment to our advantage to go towards more automated means of constructing compile optimizations, which can not only achieve state-of-the-art results, but can also minimize the human burden uh, on uh, the compile engineers. Okay, now let's see how we can achieve this. To see this, let's uh, try to zoom into a typical compile optimization pass. And specifically, let's try to look at its decision-making components. You can read it as any three different parts. First, I need to know what transformations are legal for it to make. And usually this is encapsulated as a subspace of all semantically equivalent transformations that particular compile optimization pass is intended to do. And next, the compiler needs to know how profitable each transformation is. And usually this is exposed through a cost model. And finally, at the heart of the transformation pass is an optimization strategy that traverses this subspace to find one such profitable transformation that will be finally applied to the code. And the efficacy of a given uh, compile optimization pass depends on how realistically you model these three components. Ideally, you want to use ground truth runtime as uh, instead of using a cost model. And ideally, you would want to use an optimization algorithm that guarantees to find you the optimal solution or the solution with the lowest possible cost. But in reality, these components are approximated. Compile engineers or researchers use simplified hand transferred heuristics to guide the optimization strategy. And instead of using the ground truth runtime, they use simplified handcrafted cost models to ascertain profitability. And in the rest of the talk, I'm going to show you how you can go from these manually written heuristical solutions to more automated means of constructing compile optimizations, taking my work on compile auto vectorization as an example. Uh, more specifically, first I'll show you how to perform compile auto vectorization optimally with the aid of a solver. And secondly, I will show you how to learn compile auto vectorization from the scratch, from scratch, possibly eliminating the need for having a handwritten optimization algorithm altogether. And thirdly, I will show you how you can uh, develop more accurate cost models, again using data, which can significantly outperform analytical models out there. And finally, I will convince that these data-driven techniques apply beyond compile optimizations to other, uh, apply beyond vectorization to other compile optimization paths as well. Okay, now let's look at compile auto vectorization in more detail. The, uh, the high level idea behind compile auto vectorization is to automatically convert scalar code written by programmers into vector code that runs on parallel hardware. And there are mainly two different forms of compile auto vectorization that are suggested in literature. First one is loop vectorization, and the second one is super word level parallelism based vectorization. And in this talk, I'm going to uh, focus on the most general form of vectorization, which is the SLP based vectorization. And in SLP based vectorization, the compiler can select two or more scalar statements, which are independent and isomorphic of each other, and first coalesce or merge them into vector packs which are later converted into vector instructions during the compiler code generation phase. Here, what I mean by isomorphic is that these scalar statements should perform the same operation on the same data types. And if this condition is met, and if these scalar statements are independent of each other, then it is perfectly legal for the compiler to emit vector code instead of this scalar code. Okay. So an important problem that the compiler needs to solve uh, during SLP-based vectorization is to select which statements gets packed together into these vector packs. To do that, first the compiler needs to know what opportunities exist for vectorization. So to make it more concrete, let's look at a simple example. 
Here I show you a, code, a simple code snippet with two isomorphic groups of instructions. First, doing divisions on values loaded from array L to produce intermediate values A1 up to A3. And the second, doing subtractions on these intermediate values to produce final values A4 up to A6. And if you assume the vector width of the machine to be two, then you can select any two statements out of each isomorphic group to vectorize. And this is going to be your entire transformation space the compiler should focus on for this small code snippet. And note that not all of these uh, statement packing opportunities can coexist with each other. If a particular statement is part of one vector pack, it cannot be part of another. So the final decision the compiler needs to make here is to select a subset of these uh, vector packs to materialize such that the final profitability of the code is maximized. Okay. Now let's look at an example uh, uh, statement packing strategy. Let's assume that the compiler decided to pack statements S1, S2, as well as S5, S6 together. These are perfectly legal uh, statement packing opportunities, and as such, it can go ahead and ve emit vector code. However, any compiler transformation needs to be semantic preserved, meaning that the, scalar, uh, the vector code should perform the same computations as the scalar code. So here, the compiler may need to do certain fix-ups to preserve this property. To, uh, to make it more clear, let's look at this vectorized value, A3 and A1, and try to locate its constituents. And if you look closely, you can see A1 is already in vector form and is packed together with A2, whereas A3 is in scalar form. And as such, these two constituents are in non-isomorphic forms and are illegal to be vectorized. So to remedy this situation, the compiler needs to first unpack A1 out of its vector form and repack it with A3, incurring an overhead of two instructions. And if, it, and if you go about fixing up all these problems, for this particular vectorization strategy, it requires three overhead instructions. Now let's look at an alternative strategy. Instead of selecting statement H1, S2, assume that the compiler selected S2 and S3. Instead of statements S5 and S6, let's assume that the compiler selected S4 and S5. And if you follow the same statement packing methodology, you can show that this particular vectorization strategy is able to emit five vector instructions and only incurs a cost of two additional overhead instructions. So even for this small code snippet, based on the uh, decisions taken by the compiler, the profitability of the final vectorization schemes can vary drastically. And in fact, the first strategy follows a, a, a heuristical algorithm that is suggested in the literature, and the second strategy can be shown to be optimal for this code snippet. So a natural question to ask here is, how difficult is optimal statement packing in general? Remember, what I have shown you here is one basic block out of many in an end statement function. And let's assume that you are only uh, going to pack two statements at a time. Then there are order n amount of opportunities for each and every statement in the function. And if you consider packing all, uh, uh, doing vectorization for all statements at a time, then there are exponentially many opportunities. And in fact, you can show that the statement packing problem is a special case of the optimal subset selection problem, which is known to be NP hard. So in fact, we are solving a very hard problem. So in literature, what people have suggested are mainly greedy or heuristical solutions. There have been attempts at doing local searches, especially on small instruction windows, but most of, most of the global search-based optimization strategies have deemed to uh, have proven to be intractable. And now I will show you how you can make it tractable with the aid of a solver. More concretely, we reduce the statement packing problem into an integer linear programming problem, and we formulate these ILP problems for whole functions at a time, arriving at a globally optimal result, or more correctly, a pairwise globally optimal result. The high-level idea behind the ILP formulation is simple. What you want to do here is to encode the benefits and costs of the vectorization into the objective function of the ILP formula, and then you can use any of the ILP solver to do the search for you. 
But however, in order to make this uh, strategy tractable, the representation or the encoding of the ILP formulation matters a lot. In fact, there have been original attempts at formulating uh, vectorization as an ILP uh, problem. And here I'm going to focus on one such formulation that is suggested in Larson's original thesis. He formulated ILP problems for, for entire vectorization paths at a time, and this resulted in an encoding complexity, which was exponential in terms of the number of statements in the function. And this particular strategy, even if you want to solve a representative uh, benchmark, takes more than 24 hours and is not acceptable. So can we do better? And if you look at the problem more closely, you can identify that even though we are solving a global optimization problem, the encoding can be done locally. This is because the benefits and costs of a statement packing only depend on a local neighborhood of the uh, uh, statement packs we are creating. More specifically, the benefits only depend on the selected statements that are going to be packed together, and the costs depend only on its immediate uses and definitions. So with this insight in mind, we can now go ahead and do a local encoding of costs and benefits, and still use an ILP solver to uh, arrive at a globally optimal result. So we developed this strategy in a framework known as GoSLP. And now instead of formulating a ve uh, SLP-based vectorization uh, per path, we can formulate it per path, resulting in an encoding complexity that is quadratic in terms of the number of statements out there. So in the worst case, even to compile a benchmark with 40 different files, now it only takes around eight minutes. Okay. Now I will quickly go into some details about how we would go about uh, encoding this ILP formulation. To do that, let's take this uh, simple code snippet as an example. Here, the first two statements loads values from array X, but at two disparate uh, locations. And the second two statements load vary, uh, values from array Y in contiguous memory locations. And finally, these loaded values are used in a series of addition instructions from S5 up to S7. So the first task of the compiler under the GoSLP framework is to uh, identify the, the entire transformation space or the opportunities for statement packing. You can pack these contiguous uh, loads or vectorize these contiguous loads together and it's a perfectly legal opportunity as well as you can select any two statements out of this isomorphic group of additions to vectorize. And this is going to be your entire transformation space for this particular example. And next, it creates decision variables for each and every opportunity in this transformation space. And these decision variables are Boolean, signifying whether the compiler decided to vectorize or not. Now, uh, with these decision variables in hand, you can formulate the ILP problem or, or you can encode the benefits and cost of vectorization into the objective function of the ILP formula as a linear combination of these decision variables and solve it subject to certain constraints. And one of these constraints is that a particular statement can be part of only one vector pack. And we are going to formulate this uh, ILP problems pairwise, and then to exhaust the entire vector width of the machine, we are going to iteratively formulate more, and more problems such that you, uh, we utilize the full vector width of the machine. Okay, now I will, quickly show you how to encode one benefit as well as one cost in this framework. And to do that, let's look at this vectorized value S3 and S4. I'm going to ask the question whether it's beneficial to execute S3 and S4 in vector form compared to executing it uh, in scalar form individually. And if this is true, then the quantity that I have shown you in the slide is negative. And if you, you only get this benefit, if uh, both statements S3 and S4 is vectorized. And this is how you go about encoding this benefit. Now let's look at one of, uh, how do you go about encoding one particular cost. Again, consider statements S3 and S4. And now let's hypothetically think that it is vectorized and try to locate its uh, vectorized users. So S3 and S4 statements, when it's vectorized, has the potential to be used by statements S5 and S6, as well as statements S6 and S7. 
and if either of these users are vectorized, and if the original definition of S3 and S4 is not vectorized, then you need to incur a mandatory packing cost. And this is how we would go about encoding them. Okay, next I implemented the Goya selfie strategy inside the LLVM compiler and benchmarked both uh, spec 2006, spec 2017, as well as NAS benchmarks to, to see whether we can come up with a superior vectorization performance. And here I show you certain, some results or highlighted results. Mind you, these are, no, uh, these are not simple kernels, but are end-to-end -end programs which have more than thousand or uh, tens of thousands of lines of code. In fact, for the benchmark Imagic, which has more than 250,000 lines of code, we are able to achieve more than 16% speed up over and above what LLVM would give you. And in this graph, I show you the complete results for all the benchmarks I considered uh, uh, in this experiment. In the y axis, I show you the percentage speed up that each benchmark uh, uh, reaches with the aid of uh, GoSLP over and above the LLVM's vectorizer. And in summary, we are able to achieve 7.58% speed up on SPEC 2017 FP, C, and C programs. And if you are unfamiliar with SPEC benchmarks, to put this result into perspective, Intel's major microarchitectural revisions usually achieve around 20% on the same benchmarks. So you can think of uh, our technique as achieving around 40% of what Intel would achieve with a billion dollar investment. And moreover, this particular strategy is able to automatically correct the two erroneous judgments made by compilers that I uh, uh, described towards the beginning of my talk. Okay. Now we have a good enough solution. So we are happy. But there are, if you look at the solution more closely, there are two undesirable characteristics of it. First, we are still using an ILP solver. Therefore, the solution times can be unpredictable. And secondly, even if we go, uh, need to go beyond uh, linear cost models, we cannot do this under the current framework. So this motivates us to build a new uh, methodology which can first learn the best decisions taken by the ILP-based solution, but is also extendable to our arbitrary cost models that we will develop in the future. And this is where end-to-end -end learning of optimization policies can help. And now I'm going to show you how you can uh, learn how to vectorize uh, from scratch or using data. Okay. So let's step back and see what we want to achieve here. What you want to learn here is to automatically translate a scalar representation of a code into a vector representation of the same code. So this has the flavor of translating from one language to another. Therefore, you can use maybe use something like machine translation that is prevalent in natural language processing literature. However, in the context of compilers, this doesn't quite work because we need to guarantee 100% correctness in any transformation that we do. Therefore, instead what I do is I exploit the compositional structure of the transformation. And as compiler engineers, we have been exploiting the compositional structure uh, mainly at the pass abstraction level, rather than writing compiler as one monolithic transformation that translates the high level language to a low level language. We write it as a series of transformation passes which are applied one after the other. And this, this composition of this application still guarantees to produce a uh, correct code. And if you look at an individual compile optimization pass, this composition structure is there, but it is implicit. So my solution is to expose it. More concretely, rather than think of, uh, thinking of vectorization as one monolithic transformation, you can think of it as trans transforming uh, or vectorizing one statement at a time until you reach a state where there are no more vectorization opportunities out there. So with this composition and structure uh, exposed, we can now go ahead and model vectorization or any other compile optimization as a sequential decision-making process, similar to how AI researchers have modeled board games. And more technically, this is how we would go about uh, modeling vectorization as a Markov decision process. You can assume, uh, you can think of the original scalar code that the compiler receives 
as the initial state in this uh, decision process. And then for a given statement, you are going to expose all valid vectorization opportunities out there as your action space. And next, a learned agent can select any one of these valid actions to perform. The key uh, here is I'm only going to expose valid actions for a given statement. So any action that the learned agent is going to take is going to be correct by construction. Therefore, once a particular action is taken, you can go ahead and mutate the code to reflect these guys to arrive at a new state. And if you iteratively apply this procedure, finally, you will reach a terminal state at which point there are no more vectorization opportunities out there. And at this point, you can uh, run the code to see whether you have done a good job at vectorization. And this can be part of your reward function. Okay. So with this uh, sequential decision framework uh, uh, established, the next task is to actually design an agent that, will, that knows how to take a, uh, uh, the most optimal action given a state. And our solution here is to actually imitate the, the, uh, the decisions made out by the ILP-based Oracle GoSLP. And in this framework, we, we have to first collect demonstrations from the Oracle. So for a given program and for a given state, and also for a given statement, we ask what the Oracle, how the Oracle would go about vectorizing this piece of code. And assume for statement A1 here, if the Oracle chose to vectorize with A2, you can go ahead and mutate the code to arrive at the next state. And at this point, you are going to record the original state as well as the action taken by the Oracle into a state action pair bar. And you are going to do this for all state programs and for all states that you see in your training set. And once this uh, uh, state action pair buffer is fully uh, populated, next you can use a properly crafted neural network based, pol based policy to take the most optimal action given a state. And if you uh, uh, train this in a vanilla way, this doesn't quite work well. This is because the uh, learned policy does not know how to correct its trajectory if there are uh, simple errors or if it falls out of the optimal trajectory. To alleviate this problem, we use uh, an algorithm that is prevalent in AI literature known as Dacker. So at each epoch, epoch of training, for, for all the states that we have collected so far, we are going to first run our policy network. And here, the uh, policy network, and it will suggest a particular action. And these actions may not be optimal for a particular state. And next, we are going to collect a new set of states following the actions taken by the policy network. And after that, we are going to take these new states and ask the Oracle to perform uh, vectorization optimally, given that uh, all the vectorization decisions up to this point are fixed. So now, uh, with access to these new state action pair buffers, you can augment your uh, 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 state, uh, with access, uh, access to these new state action pairs, now you can augment your uh, replay buffer with them. So the key here is now the neural network based policy no, uh, has more experiences to choose from to, uh, to correct any small deviations of uh, its vectorization policy. And towards uh, the end of this section, I'll show you that this, poly, uh, this particular vectorization scheme works pretty well. Okay. With this training regime set up, the next thing is to actually insert or actually see how we can, uh, you, uh, how we can insert a particular program into a neural network or how we can reason about programs in the continuous domain. So one of the goals uh, in designing this state representation is to make it as easy for the compiler developers as possible. And again, as in the case of the ILP-based solution, representation matters a lot for, uh, for the learned vectorizer, but in this case, for mainly for learnability, not for tractability. And the representation we chose was the program dependence graph. And this is naturally occurring in inside any compiler. So the amount of development effort that the compiler engineer needs to take is minimized. Okay, so, 
So once we have represent the state as a, as a program defendants graph, next we can select a particular statement. And in this case, they, uh, for example, statement A1, next you can select uh, uh, its vectorization opportunities. So we are going to ask the question whether it's profitable to vectorize A1 with A2 or A4. And say that the neural network based policy uh, said that it is beneficial, beneficial to vectorize with A2. Now you can go ahead and mutate the uh, state structure by adding vector nodes to it. And you can uh, iteratively uh, uh, do this procedure by going to the next node with the vector, with vectorization opportunities out there. And since we represented our state as a graph, we used a graph-based neural network uh, as our function approximator. More concretely, we used the gated graph neural network to represent. And our question again from the coming, uh, there is a one to one correspondence between a node in the state representation and a node in the uh, neural network uh, formulation. Okay, so with this training regime and the state representation fixed, next we want to test out whether this particular system can learn a good enough policy. To do that, I trained uh, this system on SPEC 2006 and SPEC 2017 benchmarks and tested it out on NAS parallel benchmark source. The, the key uh, thing here is I want to test whether we can learn a policy that is generalizable across a number of different benchmarks. Okay, here I show you results for both the ILP-based solution GoSLP as well as the learned vectorization solution BMAL. And in the y-axis, I will show you the speed up for both the systems over and above the LLVM vectorizer. So anything above one in this graph is good. And if you look at closely at the runtime results, you can see for five out of the seven benchmarks out there, the learned policy is able to match or exceed the performance of the Oracle. So that means uh, we did a good job. Uh, the learned policy is able to match the performance of the Oracle pretty well. But however, there's something fishy going on here. It's okay to match the performance of the Oracle, but how come it exceed the performance of the Oracle when it learn from it. That's counterintuitive. So let's look at the performance results again. And if you look at uh, these results closely, there are cases where the heuristical LLVM solution is actually better than the optimal GoSLP solution. And as I've already uh, uh, sh shown you, there are cases where the learned solution consistently outperforms the, uh, the ILP-based solution even when it considered it as the Oracle. So the question I'm, uh, that should naturally come to mind is how can the optimal GoSLP or the ILP-based solution be slower than any system? So to, to investigate or to dig deep, I conducted another experiment. Now, I took all the unique loops out of SPEC 2017 FP programs and run it on, ran it under three conditions. First, without any vectorization, and next with the LLVM vectorization, and finally with uh, the ILP-based vectorization. Next, I computed the percentage reduction in runtime for both vectorization schemes. And in this graph, I tab uh, tabulate the percentage reduction in runtime for both the ILP-based vectorizer as well as the LLVM's SLP vectorizer. So in the y-axis, I show you the percentage reduction in runtime, and it is uh, uh, anything above zero is good, and higher the better. And if the world is ideal, and if the uh, ILP-based solution is truly optimal, or more correctly, pairwise optimal, the red line should lie above the. Uh, blue line. Multiple dips, not only one or two dips, there are multiple dips across multiple different uh, loops in this benchmark. So, so this begs the question whether our ILP based solution is optimal or is, uh, or more correctly, pairwise optimal. It is, but with a catch that we assume a linear execution model. But if you look at modern microprocessors, their execution behavior is anything but linear. The modern microprocessors are super linear, uh, 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 sorry, super scalar, heavily pipelined out of order machine. So this motivates us to uh, build more accurate cost models. 
And now I'm going to show you how you can go about building these accurate cost models again using data. More specifically, the, the, the problem I'm interested in is how do you build an accurate basic block throughput uh, predictor? Actually, accurate modeling of a, a processor is a hard job. Even the most sophisticated analytical cost models out there, like LLVMs on MCA and Intel's on IACA, has an error rate of almost 20% when modeling a modern day microprocessor. This is because if you want to uh, accurately predict the runtime of a small piece of code, then you would need to model all the intricacies that are within a modern day microprocessor. Be it modeling micro caches, be it modeling uh, load store buffers, or be it modeling port map, et cetera. And aggravating this fact, some of these implementation details are hidden by, uh, are held proprietary by the processor vendors. So getting a 100% uh, accurate prediction is virtually impossible. So what the analytical model writers do is they consult thousands of pages of vendor manuals and convert them into a specific, uh, into a performance specification inside uh, the compiler. And these performance models can usually span uh, thousands of lines of code. And as you can see, this process is both tedious to develop and to maintain. And this translation from uh, uh, the vendor manuals into a specification can inevitably, uh, can involve a lot of human error. And there would inevitably be modeling error because not everything is uh, mentioned or uh, tabulated in this uh, vendor manuals. Some uh, details are held proprietary. So compared to these analytical models, we took a drastically different approach. Rather than trying to model every uh, integracy within the processor, we collected a bunch of data of uh, basic blocks and its runtimes and then we use a properly crafted neural network based architecture to learn how to predict the runtime of a given piece of code. And we show that this particular uh, approach is significantly more accurate than the analytical cost models out there. And now let's look at uh, the neural network, how we build the neural network architecture. So there is one key design goal that uh, uh, we had in our mind from the beginning, that is to make it as easy for, uh, for the compiler developers as possible to adopt these systems. So, so to achieve this, we first kept the same interface that is available in these analytical cost models. So our neural network uh, based architecture assumes row assembly instructions as input and produces a real value or a floating point value uh, prediction, uh, throughput prediction as its output. And secondly, we require no featureization from the compiler developer, making it easier to port it from one uh, architecture to another. And again, as in the case of the learned vectorizer, representation or the neural network architecture matters a lot for learnability of this particular, uh, for, for learnability. The, the neural network architecture that worked the best was uh, a variant of a hierarchical multi-scale recurrent neural network. Uh, and now I will uh, go into some details on how we would go about building this. And this particular architecture has three layers. Once uh, uh, the learned cost model receives the row assembly instructions and is, as input, the first task is to tokenize them into opcodes op and operands. And then in the first token layer, we are going to learn a higher dimensional token empty for each and every one of these tokens. And in the second instruction layer, all the tokens for a given instruction is summarized through, uh, by running it through an LSTM to arrive at a set of instruction embeddings for all the instructions out there. And finally, at the, in the prediction layer, these instruction embeddings are summarized by another LSTM into a block embedding. A key to note here is that these two LSTMs are two different and, and there is no weight share in between them. So this is different. This is, uh, this is different from a normal layered LSTM architecture. And finally, with access to the final block embedding, you can run it through a multi-layer perceptron to arrive at the uh, real valid throughput prediction. So with this neural network architecture in place, 
Next, we collected more than 1.4 million basic blocks out of uh, representative benchmarking uh, benchmarks like SPEC 2006, SPEC 2017 uh, benchmarks, as well as from end use applications. Next, we ran these applications on bare metal and collected the supervised data sets data set of basic blocks and their respective uh, timings in clock, clock, clock cycles. And with this uh, supervised data set in hand, then you can uh, train the, uh, the, the, the neural network architecture that I mentioned before using any supervised learning technique out there. In particular, we use uh, the MAP loss uh, to train this. And here I show you results uh, that we saw on our test set. In particular, I show you uh, the average prediction error for three different systems, two analytical cost models, LLVM MCA and IACA, and the learned uh, cost model ITAMA. And in the y-axis, uh, uh, we tabulate average prediction error for the entire test set. So, in, so the ideal case would be zero and anything lower is good. And if you look at uh, the results closely, you, uh, you can see that the ITAMAL or the learned cost model is able to more than half the error rate across three different uh, Intel microarchitecture. So we have shown that just by learning how to predict the Boise block throughputs from data, we are able to achieve a significantly more accurate Boise block throughput predictor, which is also more portable. Okay. So far what we have done, uh, so, so the way we have employed is to actually use the or, uh, IRP based solution as the Oracle to perform, uh, to learn how to vectorize. But with the aid of this uh, basic block throughput predictor and richer cost models that we will develop in future, now you can use this as part of your reward function to learn how to vectorize using reinforcement learning. And this is where I think uh, uh, future compiler optimizations will go. And formulating compiler optimizations as sequential decision making process actually apply beyond vectorization. For example, it applies to even low level optimization passes like register allocation. More concretely, you can formulate uh, uh, the mark, uh, an MDP for register allocation as follows. The state, the state here would be a partially register allocated program. And next you can select a set of virtual registers and expose all the free general purpose registers out there as your action space. Then a, uh, a suitably crafted learned agent can select one of these valid actions. And in this case, a valid general purpose register. And assume for virtual register one, that, that the learned agent is able to select RAX as its concrete uh, general purpose register. Now we would go uh, to a new state which has strictly more uh, uh, registers that are allocated. And if you follow this process iteratively, you will reach a state where there are no, no more uh, register allocation opportunities out there or all the regis virtual registers have been allocated, at which point you can run the program to see whether you have done a good job at uh, this optimization. And moreover, not only register allocation, which is a low level compiler optimization pass, you can even formulate optimizing uh, high level optim uh, languages like optimizing uh, high level languages like Halide into the sequential decision making framework. More specifically, we can formulate Halide auto scheduling into a Markov decision process uh, uh, like this. If you are unfamiliar with Halide, Halide is a language where you can write the algorithm specification separately from the optimization specification. So for a given statement, you can first uh, expose all the valid uh, optimization opportunities out there, be it tiling, uh, vectorizing, parallelizing, and then if you select a particular vectorized, uh, particular optimization opportunity, you can also next uh, expose all the parameters uh, within that uh, uh, optimization opportunity in a hierarchical fashion. And once the alert agent uh, selects a particular validation, you can append that scheduling command to the already 
uh, filled up the uh, uh, schedule of the halide program to arrive at a new state. And if you do this iteratively, finally you will reach a state where all the algorithmic specifications are scheduled. And at this point, you can run the code to see whether you have done a good job. And this can be, uh, the uh, runtime can be part of your reward file. So as you can see, in summary, I believe that data-driven techniques or uh, data-driven techniques will play a major role in development of compile optimizations in future. And with that, I would like to thank all the collaborators and co-authors who have made my graduate school enjoyable, especially uh, the, the collaborators who are involved in the Deep Compiler project. And most importantly, Without uh, uh, support from the family and friends, I wouldn't have reached this uh, position in my life. And I would like to thank my parents as well as my wife Shashi, who's listening into this talk. And in conclusion, in this talk, I have shown you methodologies on how to go from more manual handcrafted solutions to more automatic means of constructing compile optimization. And I believe data-driven techniques will play a major role in development of automatic program optimization techniques, not only in compilers, but in other high level languages as well in future. Thank you. And with that, I would like to take any questions that you have. Okay, thank you. Uh, so if you have any questions, if you can virtually raise the hand, I can perhaps uh, 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 direct the questions round, otherwise, uh, it might be hard to do the uh, uh, synchronization protocol here. So if you have questions, please raise your hand. If I'm not seeing anybody, just go and unmute and ask a question. I mean, uh, that's okay too. So unmute yourself and ask. Wow, this is the quietest thesis defense I have been at. <laughs> uh, I can ask a question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was a great talk, Sharif. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. I have an optimization background, and I was wondering. Yeah. Uh, so for the second part, you kind of uh -huh. learned like cost function based off the uh, like data. Am I correct uh -huh. to think that way? Uh, for for the last part, right? Like we yes. learned. Yes. Yes. I see. Uh, can you then, like, in retrospect, like, compare your cost function with, like, what people use and just see, like, how better your, like, cost functions are? Uh, so I did that. Uh, if you look at the results, I compared it with two analytical cost models, LLVMMC and IACA, which are actually nonlinear cost models uh, that you can find in, uh, th that are used for optimization, especially for manual optimization. But uh, uh, in compiler, inside compilers, people use linear cost models. Even those are even worse than uh, these non-linear cost models out there. So uh, this is the comparison uh, with the state-of-the-art cost models that are created analytically. See, thank you. Okay, Lily, you had your hand up. I'll unmute you. Hi, Travis. Great talk. I'm not a. I'm not um, in this field, so I might ask a very naive question. So, how do you collect the ground truth of your last part of the talk, the data set? Oh, so we run it on real machines. Like, say, for instance, uh, if you want to collect uh, uh, data for Intel ha Haswell uh, or Intel Haswell machine, you run all of these basic blocks under a particular harness on a physical Intel Haswell machine. Is it so right? once you run it, uh, you, there, there, there are certain instructions which can count the amount of cycles that it takes for a particular piece of code to run. And this is how we collect uh, the final data set. I see. And also like this compiler, like this is our built-in, like it's not uh, accessible to like other, like the people who run the program, usually not accessible to them. Uh, what do you mean by built-in? Like, I didn't get the question. Like, I'm wondering, like, so you use, for example, the machine learning models to try to optimize the compiler. Mm -hmm. 
And mm -hmm. I wonder, like, um, like who are the people who can um, access this compiler? Uh, for example, oh. yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, so these cost models are either explicitly mentioned in the compiler or some, some, sometimes these cost models are baked into the code itself. Say, for instance, if you look at loop unrolling or uh, say uh, uh, loop fission, for instance, they have profitability metrics that are baked into the compile itself. And these profitability metrics are handwritten. So if you are thinking about uh, purely uh, about optimization, you will first need to either extract this uh, uh, profitability metrics out, or you need to uh, plug in, uh, uh, or you need to find where they use a monolithic cost model. Uh, or uh, you need to find a, uh, a place where compiler developers actually use one particular cost model for number of different passes. So for an optimization person, it would be hard to like just dive in and say, this is a new optimization algorithm and just go ahead and uh, uh, come up with the best possible compile optimization. I don't know whether that answers your question, but uh, I'm thinking <laughs> of, you have an optimization background if I'm not yeah, yeah. mistaken. So, so if you want to, uh, 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 if you want to use optimization techniques, then you have to get your hands dirty and you have to go inside the compiler. You don't have them. Ex uh, some of these cost models are not accessible outside of it. I see. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. No problem. Oscar, I see two, I, two, two more questions. Uh, yeah. Oscar, do you want to go next? Uh, thanks, Jared. This was really interesting. Uh, it's really impressive, uh, the work you've done, I think. And I'm very happy that you have, uh, you know, been doing this all the last few years. Um, I wanted to ask you about, so the, you have a cost model and you had also the, uh, the decision making part. Did you put them together? Uh, uh, that is get... some, uh, that is one project that we are, one, one, another student in our group is doing like, uh, so actually, uh, uh, we are trying to use reinforcement learning to produce more general vectorization strategy. One mm -hmm. thing here is we are only con uh, concerned about uh, independent and isomorphic instructions. But if you look at modern day microprocessors, they have vector instructions which are way more esoteric than that. You can even do addition, subtractions in the same uh, uh, vector uh, uh, using the same instruction. So how can we use that? And secondly, even if we have those uh, uh, those transformation spaces properly carved out, how do you apply, or how do you go about applying those rewrite tools? And that is where we are uh, trying to use reinforcement learning to learn how to apply rewrite tools. And to, uh, and there we will we haven't still uh, started on using uh, uh, the cost model part in it. We are still relying on the existing LLVM cost model. But in future, we want to make the entire compilation pipeline for vectorization, at least for vectorization at first, completely automated. So we will have, we will automatically generate the transformation space. Next, we will uh, automatically learn how to uh, apply the rewrite rules using the learned cost model. That's the, uh, th that's where we want to, uh, where we want to head at. Okay, cool. Okay, any more questions? Uh, uh, I see a few more hands. Yeah, can I ask a question? Yes, sure, go for it. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so very great talk, very interesting. Uh, so uh, my question is, there's this uh, common criticisms of all these compiler optimizations where mm -hmm. uh, they are very unpredictable. Like, mm -hmm. especially for things like SLP, sometimes you structure the code slightly differently and suddenly everything vectorized, right? And it was yeah. pretty bad already with all the heuristics. Like, it was right. not the particular problem of these data driven approaches. But mm -hmm. uh, before these data driven approaches, it was possible for people to hack their code and like rearrange things because they know roughly how the heuristics work, right? And, and they can, or, right. or they can even like hack into LVM to fix the problems mm -hmm. to make things mm -hmm. more vectorizable. But now mm -hmm. everything. It's like a huge black box, LSTM and whatever, right? So uh, how, how do you plan to address these predictability problem or you don't think it's a problem at all? So, so one thing to note is that how did the compiler developers come up with those heuristics? 
the way they would go about designing those heuristics is like they will run a set of benchmark programs and see all the code patterns themselves. They will try to identify common code patterns that are used in these benchmark programs, and then they will try to develop the heuristics by hand such that it will cover most of these cases. But how can you know, for instance, whether these heuristics will apply for another set of unseen programs, right? So this problem is still there inside the uh, manually written uh, uh, optimization passes, which rely on manually written heuristics. But uh, here we are coming up with an automatic technique to make it, uh, we are coming up with a uh, data-driven technique to make it more automatic. So I feel like, uh, Rather than uh, employing engineers where they have uh, 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 they are, uh, where they have smaller attention spans, we can use uh, automated search-based techniques or uh, automated learning-based techniques to come up with heuristics or come up with uh, optimal optimization strategies using the techniques I have said. And I don't necessarily believe that this is going to be uh, it's going to be uninterpretable in the sense you cannot hack the code, but it's it's not going to be, it's going to be a better strategy rather than you going into and figuring out, oh, for this set of code patterns, I need to add this heuristic. And if you look at modern day compilers, especially the loop vectorize inside LLM, they have hierarchical heuristics. One heuristic will trigger another. So I don't know whether that is interpretable in itself and if you want to hack into a code only a few people uh, will be able to hack into uh, the llvm's loop vectorizer that's at least my uh, 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 high level uh, so so if i if i summarize your answer you're saying mm -hmm. that you're not making it worse in fact you're making it more principled and more automatic so that people don't have to worry about <laughs> all those like weird heuristics and break in weird situation instead you have all these uh you, you have everything automatic and if something goes wrong you can uh you can also search the space more comprehensively and like look where it goes wrong right. in your benchmark and, okay and, yeah and, that's a good point yeah and uh, another thing to note is like say that you are uncomfortable using uh, in using these uh, machine learning based techniques just because they are black boxes you can run the traditional algorithm which is based on heuristics in parallel to this uh, 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 the techniques that i am proposing and then you can uh, based on some profitability metric you can choose either like whichever performs the best you can use so that i think will solve the, the problem i think that's um, uh, essentially how uh, people do it in databases or at least proposing to do it in databases. They will still cool. run the traditional algorithm. So, so in the worst case, you will perform as bad as the traditional algorithm. Are.